everybody talks about the 80s and how dry they were. You know, I was around then, but I was too young to remember or care. So when the 90s came around, we started getting wet. And that's all I remember is being too wet. Now these last couple years, uh, it seems like we're back into a little bit of a drier cycle. So it does make you think about shifting your management uh, to, to, to change to wet and or dry years. So. I guess we've had a few years back, uh, you know, like that 2008, 2009, uh, 2011 time frame when uh, we had excess water, we had colder winters, we had late springs and cooler summers. In those years, it was hard to get a crop established and growing regardless of which tillage system you would have been in. Typically we've had some really wet springs and summers and so trying to get on those acres in a timely fashion in the spring of the year has is, is been tough for us in, in these situations. We have squared off areas in the field that we've managed differently, whether it's using a perennial crop or a, a different type of annual crop that may not be as profitable but it, it will grow better on those areas. We, we tend to keep these areas large enough so we can use full-size equipment. Um, we have rented uh, uh, a 20-foot um, uh, no-till um, grass seeder from the district, the soil conservation district, to plant different grass seeds on different headland, on the headland to, to raise a perennial crop. When we've incorporated our no-till on especially our lighter ground that, that needs moisture, that runs out of moisture later in the season. We've been able to uh, conserve moisture to later in the season and then also get the benefit of, of better yields because of it. So uh, on some of our acres, um, depending on how bad the salinity is, uh, we've either used alfalfa, if it's kind of bad but not horrible, uh, to put on our headlands where we have the ditch effect in some cases where we felt that the soluble salts were too high to even raise alfalfa, we've put um, a grass mix with different wheat grasses that have more tolerance to salts. And we're able to produce a hay crop or an alfalfa crop on these headlands rather than uh, producing no crop at all like we were in the past. Well, uh, you know, on the acres that we've been no-tilling for a few years now, those acres are easy to see the benefit on because we needed to conserve the moisture. We needed residue cover on those acres. So in that situation, it was a no-brainer. It was, it, was it was a quick turnaround to, to know that we did the right thing. We also have acres that have higher water table. And in our shorter growing season, it is hard to uh, get them soils to warm up in the spring. And that's where we struggle with our no-till practice. At this point in time, we don't have uh, any moisture monitoring system for our irrigation. Uh, the main thing that we're looking, that I do to determine is the ribbon test, which is using a soil probe and rubbing the soil in your hand to see how sticky it is. So I guess I've been pretty basic and simple on that, but I would like to look into it. We have looked into it. We just haven't made the investment into a irrigation management, water management. I think between using no-till as well as cover crops, we're building ourselves to become more resilient to adverse weather conditions, uh, whether it be too much rain, not enough rain. We can use cover crops to manage our moisture. Uh, we can use no-till to conserve our moisture. Uh, both of them are helping with our soil structure. 